Hello, everyone. Welcome to our live webinar, Unique Perspectives and Lessons Learned from Epileptologists Serving on the Front Lines During the COVID-19 Pandemic. My name is David Ficker, and I will be moderating today's webinar. I'm Professor of Neurology at the University of Cincinnati Gardner Neuroscience Institute and Associate Director of the Epilepsy Center. I chair the AES webinar workgroup. I do have the following disclosures, Greenwich Biosciences as speaker and best doctors as consultant. In today's webinar, we will highlight uh, neurologists who specialize in epilepsies, frontline experiences, delivering care in some of COVID-19's epicenters, Italy, New York, and China. Our speakers will share important insights into what they've, what, what they've seen, how they adapted, and recommendations for moving forward in this climate. And we, uh, I, I did a little research, uh, and we have speakers spanning almost 11,000 miles from Beijing to Bologna, and that's 19 time zones. And um, despite that time difference, we were able to agree on a, a, a time for this webinar that was mutually agreeable to all the speakers, and I want to thank them for that. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acquaint you with how to send questions in the Zoom web event technology. At the bottom of your screen, you will see the Q&A button. To submit a question, type your question in the small text box at the, box at the bottom, and when finished, click Send. We will try to respond as, to as many questions as possible uh, during today's presentation after our speakers complete their presentations. Today we are joined by our speakers, Dr. Kun Wang from Beijing Tianten Hospital, Capital Medical University in Beijing, China, Dr. Francesca Bisuli, University of Bologna in Bologna, Italy, and Dr. Nathalie Jate from the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, New York in New York City. All of our speakers will present and then we will have time for questions and a panel discussion. None of our speakers have any relevant financial disclosures uh, relevant to this activity. Professor Kun Wang is a professor and director of the Epilepsy Center at the Department of Neurology at, Beige at Beijing's Tianton Hospital, affiliated with the Capital Medical University, and a principal investigator in China National Clinical Research Center for Neurological Diseases, as well as in the Beijing Institute for Brain Disorders. He has worked as a postdoctoral fellow and research scientist at University of Missouri at Columbia and a clinical neurophysiologist at Washington University in St. Louis. Clinical specialties include epilepsy and EEG, rational use of anti-epileptic anti drugs, and preoperative evaluation of intractable epilepsy. He is currently associate chair of the Epilepsy and EEG Group of the Neurological Society of the Chinese Medical Association and a member of the Epilepsy Committee of the Neurological Branch of the Chinese Physician Association, as well as Associate Chair of the Neuromodulation Committee of the Chinese Association Against Epilepsy. He presided over two projects of the National Natural Science Foundation of China, one major sub-project of the 13th Five-Year Plan of China. He has published over 50 peer-reviewed papers, which are included in the Science Citation Index and obtained four patents for drug discovery. Francesco Bizzulli is a professor of neurology at the University of Bologna, Italy. She, a neurologist and neurophysiologist presently affiliated with the University Center at the Institute of Neurological Sciences in Bologna. Dr. Bizzulli applies her expertise in epilepsy, both to basic research as well as clinical care. In 2011, she received a doctorate in sleep medicine with a study on sleep-related hypermotor epilepsy, a rare epileptic syndrome that Dr. Bizzulli contributed to include in the new ILAE classification. Her clinical and research activities focus on improving outcomes in drug-resistant epilepsies, specifically in assessing the role of surgery and targeted therapies. Genetics of epilepsy is another of her main research areas of interest. Presently, she is involved in numerous international product projects, such as EGI and EPI-25. She has been the recipient of numerous research grants from private foundations and governmental agencies. She is highly involved with EpiCare, the European Re Reference Network for Rare and Complex Epilepsies. As an active community member, Dr. Basuli is an elected board member of the Italian chapter of the ILAE. Natalie Jete is a professor of neurology and population health sciences and policy and the Bluthorn Professor of International Medicine at the 
Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. She is a neurologist with epilepsy specialty training from Columbia University. She is a health services researcher, vice chair for clinical research in neurology, and chief of the Division of Health Outcomes and Knowledge Translation Research across the Mount Sinai Health System. She is also an adjunct professor in the departments of clinical neurosciences and community health sciences at the University of Calgary. She has been the recipient of over 50 research, teaching, and clinical awards, including the ILAE Ambassador for Epilepsy Award in 2017. She is past president of the Canadian League Against Epilepsy, chair of the ILAE North America of the International League Against Epilepsy, and chair of the ILAE Guidelines Task Force. She is the, a member of the CLAE and American Epilepsy Society Executive Committees and is associate editor for Epilepsia and sits on the editorial board of Neurology and JAMA Neurology. She also maintains an active inpatient and outpatient epilepsy practice within the Mount Sinai Health System. We have the following learning objectives. First is to describe, to describe the provider's experiences, insights, and lessons learned during COVID-19. Compare and contrast the provider's experiences in each of their countries and discuss how their programs adapted and important considerations for reorganizing epilepsy care. I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Wong. Okay, I just uh, uh, closed the mute. Okay, so there is a four transmission and route for the virus to get into the body. And the droplet, the direct contact, the, aer the aerosol, and also the fecal oral. Next. So, and this and uh, organized the uh, clinical uh, symptom for the uh, patient with the COVID-19. So there is a four stage, the mild stage, the progress stage, and the severe stage, and also the critical stage. And uh, during this four stage, and uh, there, is, there is some like respiratory system syndrome, and as well as the some another and system and uh, syndrome. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, the lungs and uh, CT and uh, imaging and uh, for the different uh, stage. So for example, the mean and uh, uh, pathology is the diffuse infiltration and uh, consolidation, which involves the multiple lobes of the lung. We can see this is uh, like the, the, the infiltration and also and some of the consolidation. So this is uh, under 3D the uh, construction for the uh, CT scanning. Next. Uh, except the lung, there is uh, the other uh, system, system involved. For example, the, the, cardi uh, the cardiovascular system, the kidney, and also the liver, and also the, the diabetes, and also include the brain. Next. Next. So for the mechanism, and uh, there is a hypothesis, and the target was, oh, the previous one. Yeah, the target, okay, the previous one. Okay, the, the uh, molecular target is the endocellular and uh, ACE2 receptor which is called the ang angiotensin converting enzyme 2. And we know, and this enzyme was, uh, can, can be used to uh, adjust the blood pressure. 
So right now, this is one hypothesis, and I think the endocytic cell, and uh, this enzyme probably is, is the molecular target for this virus. Next. And uh, so for both of the central and of the peripheral nervous was involved uh, by this virus. And for example, if the central nervous was, and, uh, was involved, the patient will have the disease, headache, impaired consciousness, acute uh, cerebral vascular disease, ataxia and uh, seizure and uh, or epilepsy. For the peripheral nervous system involvement, the patient can have the taste impairment, smell and impairment, vision uh, impairment, and also the neural, neural gear. And when the scalar muscle get, uh, get involved, so the patient can have the muscle pain and also elevated uh, the serum is creating a uh, kinase level. Next. Uh, how, the, uh, how the virus and get into the nervous system? So right now there is, we, we think there is a part of the three and the pathway. The first one is the olfactory bulb. The virus can through, uh, can, uh, through the nose, then get into the olfactory bulb, and then get into the brain. And uh, the second one is the, uh, the blood uh, is directly, the blood and uh, the platelet in the, uh, in the uh, vascular system, and which can be, became the clot, and then trigger the stroke especially the uh, ischemic stroke. And another one is the cytokine storm, because uh, and the virus, when the, when the uh, neural system is uh, attacked by the, and the virus, and uh, the neuron or even the astrocyte or microglia cell can generate a lot of the cyt uh, cytokine. The cytokine storm could uh, cause the brain uh, swelling. Next. And uh, this is uh, how the uh, this is a case for the uh, COVID uh, nineteen and uh, caused the acute uh, ischemic uh, stroke. So we can see the right uh, the occipital there is a uh, acute uh, infection and uh, the lady here and also this is uh, uh, this is the lung and CT scanning and uh, show the uh, COVID nineteen and involvement in the lung and also the patient have the and uh, just like the uh, the decrease the platelet with also the increase the, the timer. Next. Uh, this is the first case and reported in China uh, the COVID-19 caused the encephalitis. And uh, this case was confirmed by the CSF, the viral DNA sequencing. So it's not just by the PCR, it's and, uh, confirmed by the DNA sequencing. So the, uh, which one was published uh, in a platform in China. Next. Next. Another case was reported by the Japanese team. And uh, this is uh, uh, also the COVID-19 caused the encephalitis. We can see from the, the right, the missile temporal and get, uh, get the legion. This is the higher and the signal here. And also this one was confirmed by the CSF, the PCR, the COVID-19 PCR and confirmed. Next. Uh, this one, uh, this one, uh, uh, the patient, uh, uh, after the patient uh, died and uh, the, the patient uh, was got the, we got the aut uh, autopsy so we, uh, the, from the brain, and uh, we verified the viral the presence in the brain. And uh, you can see both of the missile and uh, the temporal and have the, have the leading, the left uh, and probably severe and the, uh, the right side. Next. How the COVID-19 and uh, uh, get the seizure? If the brain, if the nervous system was involved, uh, can this and uh, uh, involvement uh, uh, developed into the seizure? And uh, the seizure may be provoked by the fever or the 
and, and so on, and as a trigger, this can, can be treated, the seizure can be triggered by the, by the fever or some another and the system uh, symptom. And also the seizure may be caused by the stroke or the encephalitis. And the seizure also may be caused by brain swelling from the cytokine storm. And also some of the seizure or even the subclinical seizure or the, NC, or the NCSE may present in cephalopathy from the multiple organ dysfunction or failure. So this is uh, the reason and how the seizure was developed by the patient with the COVID-19. Next. And uh, this, is, this and the article and was uh, published uh, by, the, uh, by the West China Hospital, uh, Dr. Joe's team. And uh, this report, uh, they collected some of the uh, severe uh, patients uh, with the COVID-19, but they didn't find the, uh, the, the seizure or the status. And, but some people had the seizure-like the symptom but the patient they didn't have the EEG and uh, monitor, so it was not confirmed whether they are seizure or not. Next. Uh, this is the first case was reported uh, and uh, to have the seizure after uh, the COVID-19. So next. This is from the Italian uh, uh, Italian uh, group. So we can see, and uh, there is a periodic uh, discharge from the, uh, from the uh, left uh, frontal region, periodic discharge. And uh, next. And also, and uh, the frequency increased and was clear the evolution. And also, uh, this lasts more than 10, uh, 10 seconds. So definitely this is a, uh, uh, and is an actual focal and seizure and uh, over the left frontal uh, region. Next. So after the first case reported uh, from the Italian group, so the New York, uh, the Brooklyn Hospital and reported another uh, case and uh, with the seizure, both the uh, clinical and also the uh, EEG and the evidence. Next. And uh, also the COVID-19 uh, patient, uh, and we know, and the patient also have the mental and uh, problems. That, uh, that also is very common and to see in, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, patient with COVID-19. For example, uh, some patient will have the, like uh, the fear, and uh, some people will feel uh, a loneliness and uh, some people will have the anxiety or, or insomnia. So this is uh, another and, uh, and uh, the, min the mental uh, health problem involved as in the nervous system. Next. Uh, this was reported by Dr. Zos uh, Group from the Western China Hospital and how to manage the patient with the COVID-19 during the epidemic uh, period of uh, the uh, time. They have three and uh, layer the management, for example, from the and, uh, patient and the family uh, level and also community level and also the hospital and uh, level. Next. And uh, so we also and uh, uh, review and uh, the public published the paper so for the treatment uh, and uh, so this is a common uh, medication be used to treat the uh, COVID nineteen uh, patient, the alpha interfering in uh, inhalation, and also the antivirus uh, drug like the apido, and uh, also the remedy uh, remedizava. Remedizia, uh, which was just uh, approved by the FDA, and also some old medication like the uh, clocking on the phosph uh, on the phosphate. Next, for the severe and uh, patient, especially when the patient have the encephalitis, so when we can also give the like the prednisone um, and also the IVIG. 
Next. So, and uh, so we get the conclusion and uh, that the central and the paraphyseal nervous system uh, can be uh, involved in uh, 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 the COVID-19. And this involvement, uh, uh, including the seizure and uh, epilepsy. So we got the, and, and the, the evidence. And also continual EEG monitoring is needed for subclinical seizure or the ACSE. Because we know that for the COVID-19, there are some the severe and the patient. Most of the patient was, was stay in the general the ICU and did not uh, stay in the neural ICU. So the, the patient uh, was not given the uh, continual EEG monitoring. So I think if the patient uh, gave the, was given the uh, continual EEG monitoring, probably a lot of the subclinical and uh, seizure or subclinical uh, status will be, uh, will, be, uh, will be founded. Next. So in the future, probably we need more cases with the, uh, more cases and also probably the multi-center the collaboration to get more the patient, especially get some like the, uh, the, uh, the sample from the CSF and also from the OTPC, uh, OTPC uh, to demonstrate the evidence about the COVID-19 and in the patient. Okay, I stop here. Uh, thank you. Hello? Okay, okay. Let me start from one of the star charts we are getting used to see every day to describe the growth and scale of the pandemic. Italy became the COVID-19 of the hit country after China as the pandemic shift to Europe. Now Italy has turned the corner and daily facility fatalities are on a downward trend. And uh, this uh, encouraging trend could be the result of the strict lockdown we adopted on March 11, followed closely by Spain and France, despite uh, these uh, rigid uh, measures, um, the mortality rate um, of Italy has been uh, far higher than in other countries uh, worldwide, uh, comparable only to the United Kingdom and Spain and uh, Sweden as well. I live and work in Bologna, the regional capital of Emilia-Romagna in the northeast of Italy. Emilia-Romagna ranks third in the disheartening top 10 of the most affected regions in Italy, with Lombardy and Milan on the top. Coming to my hospital, it was built at the beginning of the 20th century as a sanatorium for tuberculosis patients. And for this reason, is situated in a green area. It hosts the Neuroscience Institute, a teaching hospital dedicated to research, education, and of course, healthcare. It was the end of February when the COVID-19 outbreak came to light in Bologna, with the number of cases increasing every day thereafter. The epidemic way, it has about two weeks after Lombardy, where the hospitals in Milan reached their full capacity and shortage of beds, especially in the ICU. 
to avoid unpreparedness, local authorities decided to reorganize the metropolitan hospitals by providing more beds to COVID care. In this process, our institute was transformed almost entirely into a COVID hospital within a few days. And I have to say, without much warning, our everyday working activity was turned upside down. And this was, of course, a big revolution for all of us. So what was the impact on the organization of the neurologic department? In only three days, we had to empty the ward and clean everything. The beds for neurology, neurology and neurosurgery for both children and adults were converted into COVID beds, while operating rooms were converted into COVID ICU beds. Now we have only five beds for adult neurology, which are dedicated to urgent cases. Whereas the child neurology has been entirely moved to another hospital as well as neurosurgery. So at the moment, we don't treat children in our institute and elective neurosurgery has been suspended. The COVID unit opened on March 13. And in only five days, we went from zero to 185 COVID beds. As you can imagine, this was a major upheaval for all of us and for patients as well, including those with epilepsy. So what happened to the epilepsy care? These tables show the regular activity of our center before COVID-19. We are a tertiary epilepsy center treating patients from our regions but also from many other parts of Italy. We are uh, taking care of more than 2,000 of patients uh, with 20% um, of drug-resistant cases. Uh, we, are we have uh, a neurophysiology and epilepsy monitoring unit and uh, epilepsy surgery as well. All this amount of activity has been cancelled in only a few days. Patients in an epilepsy monitoring unit could not complete their monitoring, and patients who should have undergone elective epilepsy surgery or VNS implantation could not be operated on. They instead had to return home very quickly for the restriction of the movement. So, According to this uh, reorganization, the hospitalization for uh, neurologic disease, including epilepsy, has been minimized and limited to urgencies, including status epilepticus. Turning to medical staff, we had to deal with staffing difficulties. Most uh, healthcare workers, including uh, neurologists, have been assigned to the COVID unit. The same happened for the neurology residents who are giving a great contribution by covering day and night shifts and assisting senior physicians. Even technicians and nurses were redeployed to in the COVID unit. Consequently, we had a significant reduction of healthcare resources due also to illness or self-quarantine policies. Many of us, me included, had the infection and were forced to stay at home at least for two weeks. Moreover, many need to stay at home to take care of sick relatives or their child due to the school closure. So at, uh, as a result, the remaining staff were forced to cover all the needs of the hospital and the epilepsy center as well. Finally, we had to reorganize the epilepsy outpatient clinic. In this reorganization, we had to balance the need to keep patients and health workers safe, but also the duty to offer our patients the best care despite the pandemic. And this was a challenging task, of course. In compliance with the orders of, from local authorities, new patient visits have been suspended, whereas controls 
have been arranged uh, remotely by telehealth. Moreover, we have um, a psychologist uh, available upon request. In this uh, crisis, uh, we uh, take advantage uh, of the use of uh, on video for the diagnosis of newly onset seizures uh, or in case uh, of changes uh, in seizure semiology in the well-known patients. Uh, the on video is uh, also particularly useful uh, in the differential diagnosis uh, of psychogenic seizure that seem to occur more frequently during the pandemic due to the lockdown and the anxiety related to the COVID-19. Urgent visits and urgent EEGs are provided as usual, but only after a clinical triage to assess the urgency and the indication for the test. Overall, we try to minimize the investigations, in particular AG MRI is limited to patients with newly onset seizures and MRI is limited with, to patients with a possible treatable underlying lesion. In the other case, the uh, AG was uh, not performed. For patients in the COVID unit, we follow a specific protocol adapted from the recommendation provided by the American Clinical Neurophysiology Society. The EG is performed at bedside by two technicians, one interacted with the patient and the other in charge of the recording. Disposable cap are used and um, as a general rule, hyperventilation is not performed also in non-COVID patients, mainly to protect the staff. Most of the EG we have done in the COVID unit have been performed for subacute cognitive impairment that, as mentioned by Dr. Wong, is one of the most frequent complication, neurological complication of COVID-19. In this uh, climate, uh, some uh, local policies uh, have been um, of great help for us. For example, the e-prescription, but also the extensions of driving licenses uh, until uh, the end of August, uh, if they are expiring. And this is really important for our patients. Similar flexibility is applied for drug requiring a special prescription regime and subjects uh, with intellectual disability had a partial dispensation from movement restrictions during the lockdown with a great relief also for their families. In this challenging time, we have received great support from the epilepsy community that is actively engaged in providing plenty of tools for clinicians, researchers, and patients as well. Also, Educational needs have been addressed uh, through online courses, uh, webinars like this, uh, but also YouTube videos uh, and other media that are uh, very useful for all of us. Dealing with uh, epilepsy during the pandemic, the overall experience in Italy has been uh, rather uh, reassuring uh, with the seizures uh, being uh, rare in people with COVID-19 and uh, among the patients we treat only a few, less than 1% uh, got the infection and without uh, relevant consequences uh, on their seizures. To date, we have not observed an increase in seizure frequency in our patients, uh, older patients, I mean. On the contrary, we have noticed a reduction of phone calls uh, or messages from uh, people with epilepsy during the pandemic. And this uh, is a general impression uh, that also other colleagues around Europe uh, have had. But possibly this tendency is going uh, to change. And also we can expect an increasing uh, of cases uh, in the following uh, weeks, especially considering drug uh, shortage in some regions uh, and the lack of access uh, to laboratory testing uh, for plasma levels of anti seizure medications, since many labs did not consider this test among the essential ones. Another critical issue was only comorbidities, 
especially intellectual disability. In patients with mental or psychiatric disability, behavior disorders uh, worsen during the lockdown, increasing the burden of families. A telephone of psychological support was provided, but of course it was not enough to address the family needs. Turning to the experience in the COVID unit, we observed the neurological disorder already mentioned by Dr. Wong. I mean, uh, headache, loss of smell and taste, neurologic pain, and so on. On the contrary, we didn't observe any case with newly onset seizure. However, from the beginning of our experience, we noticed the occurrence of subacute cognitive impairment in some patients of the COVID unit. In a few cases, the clinical picture evolved into a clear-cut encephalopathy with a fatal outcome in one case. I want to show you just an example. is the case of a 47-year-old woman, a pediatrician, who, like many other physicians in Italy, got the disease visiting her patients. She started with the typical signs and symptoms of COVID-19, I mean, uh, loss of taste and smell, influenza, um, respiratory distress and severe headache. But simultaneously, she developed a subacute cognitive impairment, initially limited to language difficulties and confusion. In the end, after two weeks from the onset, due to fever persistent despite antibiotics, she was tested for the virus with positive results. And soon after the hospitalization, the cognitive picture worsened. The G revealed a diffuse lowering, and this frontal abnormalities with left predominance, whereas the MRI only showed a mild hyperintensity in bilateral pyreatal white matter. The CSF was unremarkable except for oligoclonic bands and uh, uh, even the presence of the virus was excluded. So she was treated with uh, tocilizumab and uh, uh, she recovered completely in tw two days. We had uh, other uh, five patients with similar clinical and instrumental findings. Uh, I mean, uh, e.g. with a um, slow, slowing of the background activity, mild abnormality on MRI, and uh, a, a clean um, corticospinal fluids. As Dr. Wong already showed, encephalopathy is emerging as a recurrent complication of COVID-19, with many papers on the topic coming out. The virus don't seem, doesn't seem to be relevant in many of these cases, and has been tested negative in the corticospinal fluid, an autoimmune mechanism has been suggested, but uh, the cytokine-mediated neuroinflammation is more likely to have the primary role. However, other studies are needed to clarify this hypothesis. To conclude, Italy, luckily, is now slowly reopening and uh, probably life uh, will go back uh, to some extent to what was uh, before, but obviously, there are still many critical issues to address in the care of, epilepsy, of patients with epilepsy. We are now focusing on the strategy of phase two, where uh, hierarchization and decentralization will be crucial, and the networking with local hospitals and general practitioners will be essential to screen the needs of people with epilepsy. In this context, uh, telehealth uh, will uh, still play an essential role, even if controversial, especially considering the long period. Finally, prioritization of patients will have to balance uh, healthcare resources and uh, ethics uh, to ensure the best standard of care to all people with uh, epilepsy. I conclude uh, with uh, this slogan of encouragement uh, 
that appear everywhere during the lockdown in Italy. And I would like to finish my finish by thanking all my colleagues who are working so hard and tired this night and day. Thank you very much and keep strong in this challenging time. I can go ahead with Natalie's presentation. Thank you very much. All right, so thank you very much. Um, what I will do in the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes is just go over the uh, timeline of COVID infection in the US uh, with a focus uh, in particular on New York, what to expect and um, what the impact um, has been uh, on the uh, those involved in epileptologists, for example, their own family who have been involved in the COVID crisis, uh, parent patients and their families and on clinical practice. In the interest of time, I'm not going to discuss the impact on research or education, but uh, if any of you have any questions about these areas, particularly in my role as um, vice chair clinical research in my department, there's been a, a big impact, um, but I will not uh, cover this as part of this talk. So in terms of the U.S., and you've already seen some of the estimates from China and Italy, the first case in the U.S. was identified back uh, the third week of January in Washington State uh, in a man who had returned from one on the 15th of January. And you can see uh, the timeline and how really things uh, started to peak in early April. Um, so far in the U.S., there have been over 1.5 million uh, cases as well as over close to 100,000 uh, deaths as a result. You can see um, areas where the number of cases have been quite high. Uh, New York and New, uh, New Jersey area in particular have been one of the epicenter in the country. Uh, also Chicago, LA and, and other areas have had a very high uh, number of cases as well. Um, so let me um, go now to the COVID experience uh, in New York and as an epileptologist and how that has affected um, our team, our program. Um, in terms of the timeline in New York, um, as you know, the first case in the US was in January. The first case in New York uh, didn't take place until February 29. That's the first confirmed case. It was a 39-year-old uh, healthcare worker, a woman who lived in Manhattan and had just returned from Iran on February 25th. She was actually asymptomatic, uh, but notified the hospital that she had traveled and was tested and immediately went into isolation, uh, but was confirmed to have COVID. And then the second case was a lawyer in his 60s who actually lived in New Rochelle, which is north of uh, Manhattan in New York, uh, in Westchester, but he worked in Midtown Manhattan and uh, took the train to go home every day. And, and he worked very close to um, Grand Central Station, which is a, a hub of, of travelers. And many, many people go through that area. Um, he had traveled to Miami uh, soon uh, before and his children had just returned from Israel. And what you can see here is the timeline of very few cases early in Mar March, but very uh, rapidly, subs uh, you know, subsequently, and particularly end of March and, and um, early April where things really peak. This is um, New York City cases, and, and I'm pleased to, to, to show you that um, fortunately now the number of uh, cases and hospitalization has, has dramatically uh, decreased, and we are now, uh, we have turned the corner. Um, so how has this impacted, you know, our, our city and our health system and our epilepsy program? Um, the Mount Sinai Health System that I am part of is, uh, has eight hospitals. And um, in New York and Long Island, we see more than 4 million um, patient, patient visits per year with over 400 ambulatory practices and more than 42,000 employees. We're affiliated with the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. This is the timeline. Um, where you can see that very early on, even before we had our, the first case identified in New York here in Fe on February 29, on January 7, um, the emergency operating center for our uh, health system was established. And right away, we began planning what the contingency would be and what we would do, um, screening tool for COVID, everything. Things started to move very quickly. Um, and within two weeks of the first case in New York, we had established in-house testing so that we would be able to test in-house for um, 
um, to confirm COVID or not. And that was um, a huge help because we, we would be able, we've been able to get results within about three to 12 hours. Uh, so that was very helpful. And then first antibody testing also was uh, established by March 24th. You can see that though the first case was identified on February 29th, um, the um, stay at home order was not uh, put out till March 22nd. So there was still almost, you know, th you know a month, close, through close to a month where uh, still there were a lot of people uh, moving around the city. Um, and so that's, that's been the timeline. By April 14, we had already had over 2,400 COVID-19 discharge in our hospital. And um, just the week before that, we'd actually open uh, our first COVID palliative care unit. Some of the major challenges uh, for our health system leadership was um, personal protective equipment, workforce management. Many, many people were redeployed across the board, administrative assistant, technologists, fellows, residents, everyone. Physical plan and increased capacity, so identifying non-traditional patient care spaces because essentially very quickly our hospital um, almost entirely got converted into a COVID hospital. And this is just Mount Sinai Hospital. The whole Mount Sinai Health System had to go through the same uh, processes. And then of course, um, uh, issues related to testing and therapeutic. And also ensuring a stable work, uh, workforce. And, and most importantly also, um, developing a lot of wellness initiative because there were a lot of it impacted people, not only um, physically, and it was exhausting, but also in terms of mental health and, and stressors associated with this. Some of the non-traditional care spaces, including uh, establishing a makeshift hospital. This is in Central Park, New York. You can see the aerial view. And I'm pleased to report that this has now been taken down as of last week. You can see one of the main lobbies in our hospital pre-COVID. And then this is when the COVID crisis began. Um, many, many hospital rooms. This is not, was not completed yet, but got uh, established. This is, it used to be a Starbucks and it became a nursing station. And essentially every space available was converted into COVID um, bed and COVID ward. We went from about nine, just again, Mount Sinai Hospital. And remember, this is one of eight hospitals in our health system. We went from 94 to 240 ICU beds. We also had 260 patient room converted into negative pressure rooms and so on. So in our health system, overall so far, we've had over 5,000 um, patients admitted with COVID. And um, just, this is just, these are just the data at Mount Sinai Hospital, one of the eight hospitals uh, where I work at. And you can see that neurologist redeployment, including epileptologists began at the end of March, early April. This is where we had to, to get to the front line and really uh, start um, working as attendings on the COVID team. And at one point we had over 2000 patients admitted in our hospital and over 400 in ICU. So this is just an example from the EPIC, um, from EPIC where you can see that we had over 40 COVID team. Uh, we were each uh, assigned to a team and it would change every time that we would have a rotation. We would start on a brand new team. So things were very, very active and changed very quickly. Um, as we were waiting to be redeployed, and this is an experience shared by many of my colleagues, we basically um, were, you know, didn't know would we, where would we be redeployed, would we have to go to a different borough in New York and take the subway or travel to get there, how would it impact us, our family, would we get sick, uh, would we have the knowledge and skills to take care of COVID patients, would we have adequate support to help us in where there were some tougher medical decision. Um, how long would we be redeployed? What would happen to our outpatient practice? What about our team members for those of us who also teach and do research and so on? What would happen to, to those individuals? As we prepared to be redeployed, because we knew that we would be, in fact, seven out of nine of our epileptologists in our program and both epilepsy fellows were redeployed. Um, and so they were in the end two epileptologists and two nurse practitioners who essentially managed all of our outpatient care and EEG reading through televisit, telemedicine. Um, we, we, our department developed a neurologist of the day program clinic that essentially if someone with epilepsy or seizures or anyone in our neurology practice needed to, would need to go to the emergency room for an acute issue, they were seen in a non-COVID area so that they would, they would be able to bypass the very, very busy um, emergency room that was essentially filled with COVID patients. We had a very rapid expansion of telehealth visit. In fact, 
Um, I'll show you some of the data, but this expanded dramatically and we had a reorganization of our, of our practices as well. For those of you who have been, who are just about to be redeployed, if that's still the case, or um, you have to expect very rapidly changing processes. This was especially more significant when we started because still we were learning about COVID, about how to treat it, about the prothrombotic effect and when do you anticoagulate or not and so on. So essentially you have to be ready to learn a lot very quickly and you have to keep up with emails because we were receiving COVID updates every day, changes about the management, about standards, about you know, changes in PPE practices, extended PPE use and so on. And so in order to be safe and to keep your patients safe, we had to be prepared to, to change our practices very quickly. Something that, you know, we were told yesterday could change the next day. So it was a very dynamic process. We had to manage my second rotation. I was um, assigned to, the, to cover the emergency room. So I would get all the new patients who were coming in and had been admitted and I was managing myocardial infarction, acute hepatic failure, renal failure, sodium, abnormalities of up to 186, of course, the respiratory failure, very, very prothrombotic um, situation, labile glucose level, patients were not eating, we had to put in NG tubes and so on. So very quickly we had to roll up our sleeve and, and make sure that we were able, I want you to know that you know, for those of you who are just being redeployed, that we always had support. We had hospitalists that helped us if we got stuck and we usually had, you know, either a fellow, a resident, or, you know, there was always support um, to manage some of the more difficult situation. But it was important to, to make sure that we use a teamwork approach, that we remain calm, that we are willing to be flexible patient, and that it's okay to say, I don't know. You know, I haven't managed this particular comorbidity in 20 years. So um, I think that one thing that was important too, and it's important to continue to think about, there are many, in many, many places, families are not able to go see their um, their um, family members or friends. So it's not just COVID patient, but also non-COVID patients. Um, that virtual visits are okay, but they're not a replacement. So please be patient, spend time, call the families, get medical students or other to help to also call the family again and reassure them and give them updates. Because having been through this um, as a provider and also as a, a family member who lost um, a loved one um, during this period, it's very distressing for the family not to be able to be with their loved ones, especially when they are dying alone. So re keep that in mind. Um, and remember that those who are admitted, especially with COVID, are, they're scared, they're lonely, they're depressed, anxious, confused, and they don't eat, they're apathetic. And it's very hard at times to know if they're encephalopathic or just profoundly depressed as part of the adjustment reaction. So you have to be very mindful of these things. It's a very challenging time. I won't go into much detail about the neurological complication. There have been over 200 papers published already. Um, but as has been mentioned by my uh, colleagues, encephalopathy, stroke, anosmia, and headache are by far the most common complications so far. And if you are doing a retrospective chart review and you've had neurology colleagues cover some of these patients, don't be disappointed that there aren't detailed neuro exam. We had to be, we were very limited in what we could do in these, um, during this crisis and when we were managing these patients. So they were, certainly many of the neuro complications will be underreported, including the encephalopathy. Um, in our own center, we had um, uh, 183 patients admitted who had seizure, about 3% of all admissions with this median, median age. And you can see that 29%, um, one in three actually died um, and 11% were intubated, but 58% were discharged back home and we still have about 13% who are still hospitalized. So just um, almost done. Um, in terms of the outpatient epilepsy care, for us, it was a balance between uh, ensuring the safety of staff with that of patients. We wanted to make sure that the cure, acute care needs of our patients were met and we could achieve quality of care. We did have a ex, you know, significant expansion of telehealth visits. Um, in February, only one visit was done before the COVID crisis. And the first two weeks of May, there are already 136 visits. And in March and April, many of our colleagues were redeployed in epilepsy, but still a fair number considering there was only one in February. You can see the EEGs, outpatient EEGs. This is just one of the eight hospital, went from 80, about 80 a month to two, so not very many at all. Inpatient stayed relatively stable. 
um, the epilepsy monitoring unit admission dropped dramatically, and it was mostly the ICU and non-ICU a continuous CEG that was maintained. The routine EGs were lab has only been open for urgent EGs. Same with outpatient visit, only if there's an acute neurological emergency and they're mostly seen through the neurologists of the day clinic. Um, we've switched to um, majority telemedicine and non face to face visit. Epilepsy surgeries have been deferred. They are now starting to resume uh, very shortly. And neuropsychology, are, they were able to develop an online paradigm testing so that they were able to do some of the testing and now comparing the um, accuracy of, um, of uh, non face to face with face to face testing. And so we are just now in the process of starting to reopen some of our services. Um, we developed some epilepsy resources, um, as you can see here, especially for counseling, stress management, where patients could get food, prescriptions, and so on. There are great epilepsy care resources, including those from the AES, from the ILE, and also some article, this article published in Neurology, Keeping People with Epilepsy Safe During the COVID-19 Pandemic. And so in conclusion, I just want to say that for those of you who are being redeployed who haven't started yet, but if you are, it's exhausting. But I can say and speak for many, most of my colleagues that they thought it was one of the most meaningful clinical experience of their life, um, that we've all been honored to be able to care for so many wonderful individuals and family, and that um, we wish we could have done even more, spend more time with families and these patients, but that there were some limitations. And I wanna thank all my colleagues and staff who contributed to the fight against COVID-19 and for those who supported me, our staff and our patients during this crisis. Um, I want to thank several, many of my colleagues listed here who provided some of the data for this presentation and to all the healthcare workers fighting for our lives, thank you. And I just want to show this picture because it's a big contrast with what was happening inside my hospital when, um, at the day when uh, things peaked and things were very dire and many people were dying. This was the picture outside on my way home that evening. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the speaker, to the speakers for sharing their experiences with COVID. There have been a few questions that have come up. Uh, one question that I think is important to ask and, and answer is that whether the speakers consider patients with epilepsy an at-risk population, uh, uh, similar to, or, or you know, we have clearly seen that patients with COPD or heart disease are, are considered an at-risk population. What about patients with epilepsy? I'm happy to, to answer this. My colleagues can as well. Um, I think what we've seen, and certainly we're in the process of analyzing all this and we'll have more information, but what it seems to be is that um, those who, um, you know, have high mortality and so on seem to be the same who have a lot of the comorbidities associated with COVID. If they have cardiorespiratory disease, if they have you know, they have diabetes, they have heart disease, uh, if they have uh, other, you know, significant comorbidities like that. So I think that, I don't think that we've seen that those with epilepsy have higher mortality in general. I think it's, you know, if we adjust for age and sex and all the comorbidities and so on, I think that in general, the preliminary data show that it's similar, but I think that we will have more information um, as time goes on. Francesca speaking, our experience in Italy is quite uh, reassuring for uh, people with uh, epilepsy. We, as I mentioned, uh, I think that uh, people with epilepsy are not generally at greater risk uh, of being infected. We have uh, only less than 1% uh, of patients uh, who get infected, uh, possibly for the strict lockdown. And um, we didn't observe any kind of a complication of relapses of or seizure related to COVID-19 in the adult population. Possibly for children is different, but as you know, um, COVID-19 does not affect uh, uh, children in uh, high proportion. So uh, I think that uh, luckily, people with epilepsy are not uh, generally at a greater risk of being uh, um, affected uh, by the complication of COVID-19. Yeah. This is our experience, I don't know. So in my and uh, EMU unit, so 
And uh, we have a, a, a patient who came, uh, who came to the hospital from the Wuhan and for the surgical evaluation. So during the, uh, during the monitoring and uh, his daddy and uh, get the fever and then was confirmed to have the COVID-19. And after that, so we, then we go to the, and the patient with the epilepsy and to test the nuclear uh, asset, and, uh, but she is negative. So, so from, this way, uh, from this point, probably the, uh, the patient with the epilepsy is not at risk for the COVID-19. And even his daddy is uh, COVID-19 and the patient, but the epilepsy, the daughter, and didn't get infected by the COVID-19. We have time for one more question. Uh, there was a question that came up about whether the speakers think that there will be a second wave of COVID-19 and are um, the, the city, states, and hospitals prepared for that potential second wave? So I can go first in the interest of time. Um, I think we, we do expect that there will be a second wave until we have a, a vaccine. I think that um, it's, you know, it's very likely that there will be. I think we are much better pre prepared. Um, we are, you know, we're really monitoring everything closely, but I think that we have to remain uh, vigilant. And uh, I think that all those who haven't reached a peak or have been less affected at this time should learn uh, from the lessons that, that have been uh, learn in, all, in centers where in other regions that have been significantly impacted and should prepare. Yes, uh, Francesca speaking. I think uh, we hope that uh, we are more prepared for the second wave and uh, I think that uh, we learn a lot uh, from uh, this challenging experience uh, from the past uh, few months and uh, I think that uh, in the reorganization, we have to keep in mind what happened in this period. And uh, I think that uh, many critical uh, issues that we address uh, during uh, the past few months uh, uh, will be useful to reorganize uh, uh, epilepsy care and in general our hospital, in particular the importance uh, of uh, um, the local hospital, uh, the rescue plan for our patient, uh, and um, telehealth uh, uh, as well is uh, uh, been has been implemented during this period. It could be useful for the second wave. So I hope we will be more prepared than in the in the past. So in China, I just look at the news and. Uh, and uh, the cl clinical and uh, trial has demonstrated the uh, the new the vaccine probably is effective for uh, for the patient. So so from this way, I think uh, before the second uh, like the an uh, academic if that is happened during the end of this year, probably the vaccine will be available and uh, to uh, to the people. Uh, that's I think. Thank you. At this point, we will conclude the seminar. On behalf of the American Epilepsy Society, I would like to thank you for your participation in today's event. Please note that this recording and slides will be made available on the AES COVID-19 resource library within seven days. This concludes today's presentation.